So he's asking his, his followers, who do people say I am? Verse 14. They reply, some say you're John the Baptist. Others say Elijah and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Hmm. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter, it raises his hand. Jesus calls on him because you are the Messiah. The son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. This was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. Peter, you're not smart enough to like figure that out on your own. Amen. But God, so my father in heaven, revealed this to you. Verse 18, I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my Church. You know, this scripture is actually about us. You see, 2,000 years ago, Jesus spoke these words to Peter, and he told Peter, Peter, I want to build a church. Now, let me ask you this. When you're building something, is it built in a day? No. What about a month? No. What about years? No. Yeah. Actually, yeah, most projects go for years. <laughs> I don't have any other measurement of time, time decades, so I go to decades, centuries. In other words, it takes time to build things, to build stuff. It takes time, right? So for us as people, sometimes we love the results rather than focusing and falling in love with the process. Oh. If I was building a real, like, literal, physical building, you know what I should fall in love with? The hard work of taking a bunch of bricks, carrying them to the job site, <laughs> grabbing one brick at a time, and then what's the stuff? The little cement stuff? <laughs> <laughs> right? Because <laughs> if I don't actually love the process, wow. what's going to happen? I'm going to quit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to quit. After one day or two days or two weeks of building something, right? And it's not the way I wanted it. It's not, the building's not done. The lights aren't working. The air conditioning's on. Like, the chairs aren't. Man, this whole building thing sucks. I'm going to quit building the building. Whoa. Because I fell in love with the results instead of what? The process. The process. The hard work of building a church. Jesus tells Peter here, I will build my church. He didn't say I have built. So it's actually not done yet. We're actually living this scripture out right now. This is what's happening right now. We're in this process of being built into Jesus's church. So let me ask you this. What does Jesus think about the church that he's building? What does he think about you and I? 
Well, let's finish up the verse, verse 18. He says, and the gates of Hades will not overcome the church. In Jesus' eyes, you and I are undefeated. The word overcome says the gates of hell will not be victorious. They will not win in our lives. The gates of hell is not going to win in our marriages. It's not going to win in our purity. That instead of us being defeated by evil, his church, you and I, will overcome the gates of hell. That's how Jesus sees us. Winners, champions, victorious. That's what he's building, an undefeated church. That's nice. Uh, that feels good, huh? But maybe when you walked in here, you're like, I don't feel undefeated. Maybe. I don't know how you came this morning. Maybe you didn't have enough coffee. I had my three cups today. I feel good. Maybe we didn't connect with God. I had to connect with God. I have to. I need it. Well, let me tell you, who you are, no matter how your morning or your week or your month has been, you are the church of Jesus. Yes. And you've got to feel that way every single day. On Monday. On Tuesday, guess what? You're still the church. On Wednesday, you're still the church. On Thursday, you're still the church of Jesus. And if you don't feel that way, then we need to restore the radical church. And that is the title of the lesson, Restoring a Radical Church. Come on, We're going to get into today the Acts series. If you're here, you're like, what is the Acts series? Well, there's a book in the Bible called the Book of Acts. It's the actions of Jesus' followers. And when Jesus' followers are come together as a group, what are they? They're the church. They're the church. We've got to restore a radical church, a victorious church. And we're going to study out the first church, the church in the book of Acts. Let's go over here, Acts chapter 1. And we're going to see, now the book of Acts, it takes place after Jesus dies on the cross and after he resurrects, right? Now we're going to see what does he want his followers to go and do. The author of the book of Acts is a guy named Luke. So there's a gospel in the Bible called the book of Luke. And he writes about all that Jesus began to do and teach. So if you want to learn how to follow Jesus and how to be like him and what did he expect, how to follow him, read the book of Luke. But then, if you want to see people who live out those teachings, you've got to read the book of Acts. The book of Acts is like the sequel. It's the part two to the story of Jesus and his followers. Let's pick it up. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about that all that Jesus began to do and teach. So this is Luke. Luke is writing the book of Acts to a guy named Theophilus. And he says, in my former book, I wrote about what Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them, gave many convincing proofs he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, he was eating with them. He gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem. But wait for the gift my father promised, which you heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days he'd be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and they asked him, Lord, at this time are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. <laughs> After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. You know, I love this passage of scripture. Because Jesus has provided the sacrifice for his church. He's provided salvation, and the last thing Jesus gives his people, the last thing he gives us is a purpose. Come on, he says, hey, You've got to go be my witnesses, be my messengers. You've got to go out. 
teach people how to follow me. And he gives a little bit of an outline. And if you study the book of Acts, the book of Acts follows this outline. He says, first you got to preach in Jerusalem. That's right where they were. That's, so they don't have to go nowhere. They're in the city. But then you got to go to Judea and Samaria. Those would have been the surrounding cities. So let's take Los Angeles to be Jerusalem. Right. Surrounding cities would have been like North America. It would have been like San Diego, San Francisco, Seattle. It would have been, right? But then he doesn't just stop there. Jesus says, then you've got to go and preach where? To the ends of the earth. I mean, we're talking India, China, Africa, the jungles of the Amazon. We're talking all over. That's what Jesus died for. All the marbles. All 8 billion people in the world. They need to hear the message of Jesus Christ. Okay. That's the plan. Then Jesus is like, I'm not going to be here to do it. And he's like, floats up to heaven. He's just, <laughs> says a little cloud covers him. He's like, rides the cloud. And just... We know uh, in Acts 7, I'll touch on it later, he sits down at the right hand of God. So then, what's next? Well, what's next is really a question. Can God and can Jesus rely on us? My first point, God's reliable kingdom. God's reliable kingdom. You know, the book is addressed to Theophilus. If you, you know, back in Acts chapter 1 verse 1, it says, hey, I'm writing this book for you, Theophilus. Now, there's like really this question, is Theophilus a real guy that Luke was writing to? Or is Luke using a writing technique? What does this mean, the writing technique? Theophilus, it means lover of God. So either this guy was a real person who came to name him, lover of God, or this book is written to all people who would be lovers of God. I actually think it's both. I think it's written, there was a guy named Theophilus, but I think God, writing through Luke, made it so that anyone who would love God would read this book and be like, oh my God, God, you can rely on me. That any group of people who would come together and love God, they would say, God, you can rely on us to save the whole world, to be your church. You know, Jesus, when he resurrected, it says for 40 days and 40 nights, he preached about one thing, the kingdom of God. He preached about us. He preached about this group. I really love this passage of scripture because this tells us what we have to do. There's no other option. I want to look at God and let God count on me. Coach, put me in. I want to do what you need me to do. You know, you guys ever heard of love languages? Yeah. Right? There's like words of affirmation. When someone genuinely compliments you, like a specific compliment, if they write it down, it's even better because you can go later on and read it. It's <laughs> love. You know. There's quality time, yeah. hanging out with someone. Mm. It doesn't have to be a long time. It's just like, we're just together, full attention. Yeah. Right? Physical touch, good hug. I'm a physical touch. I like hugging. Oh, yeah? Means I, I love you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, everyone knows. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's giving gifts. Oh. Right? Where it's not about how much the gift costs, but it's about how thoughtful the gift is. Yeah. Yeah. For example, I'm a Denver Broncos fan. All right, put it on. Let's go 49ers. your pain, bro. All right, and then last but not least is acts of service. Where that we go out of our way to serve, serve someone what? Serve someone that we love. Because I love you, I want to serve you. That we would be willing to inconvenience ourselves for someone that we say is valuable and worthy. Someone that we care about. And here's the thing, there's so much love going on in this pastor's scripture. God gave us a gift, salvation. God gave us a gift, purpose. Wow. God wants to spend time with us. If you guys uh, are familiar with Matthew 28, the Great Commission, right? He says, go make disciples of all nations, baptize them, teach them to obey everything, and surely I am with you. So when is he with us? When we're going out and making disciples. He's with us all day. He wants to spend quality time with us. 
So I'm going to ask, well, why is he with us? I believe to hold us accountable. <laughs> to hold us accountable, make sure we're doing, we're living out our service to God. All right? What are the words of affirmation? He's affirming us. He says to the apostles, to his father, he goes, you will receive power when you go to Jerusalem. In the same way we come to church to receive power. Why? To go out in a powerful way. And make disciples. Man, someone, sorry, imagine if someone walks up to you every day and was like, hey, Madeira. Hey, yeah, she doesn't feel like it, but you're powerful. Imagine someone woke up and said, Calvin, you are powerful. Like those words, right? We should be, man. That's a great way to start. I'm like, can you come back tomorrow? Come back tomorrow and just tell me I'm powerful. Like, woo! Right? Like, yeah. Yeah, that's what God wants to let us know. Right? You see, being reliable, it's a demonstration of the love between God and his people. That's what it's all about. Anything less, like, yeah, I just don't love God. And I'm not sure if God loves me. Most people, they're not actually living out the Great Commission for one simple reason. They don't know. Yeah, bro. They don't know. Like, most people think, like, oh, I got to follow God. I got to go to church, sit there, like, you know, put a little gold star by my name for attendance. But Monday through Saturday, I do what I want. And as long as I show up next Sunday, get another gold star by my name, I'm good to go. Yeah. It's like an attendance thing. Honestly, I grew up in church, and I thought it was more of like a book club. Yeah, we talk about a book, maybe read it sometimes. And then we all agree the book is great, and we move on. That's true. That's bro. literally the definition of a book club, right? Like, come on. Oprah got a book club. Like, it's a book club. You read the book, and you talk about it. Yay. But the Bible's so different because it calls us to action. Right. The author of the book wants to rely on the reader, not just to agree with the book, but to do what it says. To go out and to save the world. What about the guys in this story that Jesus was talking to directly? Did they do it? Is there an example of everyday, ordinary human beings who actually did the purpose that they were given? Well, let's go over here, Acts chapter 2. So it says right here in verse 36. Now, the guy speaking is Peter. Remember, he was the one where Jesus said, hey, what do people say about me? Oh, you're like a prophet. Okay, what do you say about me? And it was Peter who raised his hand. He goes, you're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. He goes, Peter, good job. I'm going to build my church. And right after that, he gives Peter the keys to the kingdom. He tells Peter, hey, you're going to be the one to open up the doors to the church. Wow. You're going to help the church begin. That's what he tells Peter. Let's see Peter live that out. Acts chapter 2, verse 36. It says right here, Therefore, let all of Israel be sure of this. God made this Jesus who you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. They said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for... The forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, God is a gift giver. Amen. Amen. The promise is for you, your children, for all who are far off, for all who the Lord our God will call. With many words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Oh my goodness. I couldn't imagine going from just a small group of 120. And in one day, the church grows to three. Like, look at it. There's not even 3,000 seats. This might be 120 seats for the original 120. But here's the point. God relied on Peter and the apostles to save 3,000 people in Jerusalem. And here's the thing. God was right to trust those men and women. I believe God is still right today to trust this room of men 
and women. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, yeah, look, the middle section looks pretty full. That's nice. If you look around, there's very few empty seats here. But pretty empty over there. <laughs> oh, we got three over here. <laughs> but we actually have to fill this room. Come on. Come on. We have to fill this room with disciples. We have to fill this room with people who are fully committed to Jesus. They're so committed that God and Jesus can rely on them to outgrow this room. I don't want to meet here very long. I like this room. If this room was bigger, I, I would like to be here for forever. But it's, I plan on outgrowing this room. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, I walk in here every day, and I hope you guys walk in here every Sunday, and you're like, man, I can't wait to leave this room. Yeah. And I'm going to do my part by actually making more disciples. Come on. Come on. Come on. Why? Because God is relying on me. Yeah. God is relying on you. God is relying on us. Right. Let's keep reading Acts chapter 2, verse 42. The church just grew to 3,000. The Bible's going to describe a description of what 3,000 people in the church look like. Verse 42. They, who's the they? The 3,000. The people who just started following God. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number... Then, those who were being saved. You see, I love this section of scripture. It's a pretty cool yeah. description of church. Come on, bro. I don't just mean the Sunday meeting. I mean the church. Yeah. It says, man, they prayed together. They had fellowship. They enjoyed hanging out. They ate food in each other's homes. And you know, you know I'm serious. <laughs> I'm not eating food. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm serious. I have a conviction. And it's in the Bible. Okay? I'm believing the right thing. I like hanging out. You know, I want the church to grow. It says every day the church in the Bible grew. Every day new people were following God, getting baptized as disciples every day. And we want all the results, right? Those results sound nice. Eating together, being friends, praying together. That sounds nice. It is nice. It's good. But we can't focus on the results. Yeah. We have to trust what? The process. Mm -hmm. The process. Because God is building a church. There's a process to it. What's the process here? It's verse 42. They devoted themselves. No devotion? You can't get the rest of the stuff. You can't get the rest of the stuff. We're not devoted to each other. We're not devoted to relationships, having each other over, to cooking. If we're not devoted to inconveniencing ourselves for, yes. for each other, no. no devotion, none of the good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So we got to love the devotion. We got to love making a commitment to God, a commitment to each other, a commitment to sharing, a commitment to our giving. It's a commitment. It's a devotion. It's an every. Day decision to be a person that God can rely on. Yeah. So the process is nice. I'm glad we read through it. But our job is to focus on verse 42. Where do I need to increase my devotion? That's the question. Where do I need to increase my You know the hard part about devotion? Devotion goes against emotion. Devotion goes against emotion. If, if you're studying, if you study the Bible, or you're a disciple, or you used to be a disciple, let me tell you what you're gonna face every day for the rest of your life. 
your emotions. Right. Emotions in and of themselves, they're not bad. Yeah. Emotions are very good. They're very human. In fact, God has emotions. We share the emotions with God. Emotions are good. The issue is when we live by the emotions right. over and above the Bible. <laughs> hey, I was going to like devote myself to reading and praying every day to church, but I just felt too tired or someone in the church heard me. So I felt, I felt like that was wrong. So now that it's wrong, I can, I can not follow God. But that's what my feelings tell me. It didn't feel right. I just didn't, I stopped feeling it anymore. So, so you never started following God because of devotion. You started following God because of emotion. Oh, call it out, Nate. It wore off. The, the shininess of the church, ooh, and I thought it, it went away, and now came time to, to test the devotion. Wow. And sometimes come up empty. Wow. The issue is never God. God, let me tell you for surezies. <laughs> God is not the one with the problem. I, I guarantee you that. I believe you, bro. I guarantee you his ways are not the problem. It's the issue of devotion. When the emotion comes, it's going to reveal what you're really devoted to. It's, it's always going to be like that. I like to ask this question. And I have to ask this question almost every day. If everyone in the church was like me, what kind of church would this be? If, I have to ask this because I'm the leader. But I hope that we would take some ownership. I hope that we would all be in this together. Hey, if everyone in this church was like me, what would it be? Was I late this morning? Was I in, was I in there singing? Glory, glory. Oh, no. And this is the part of the song where we yell, hey. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You sit down. It's funny. I find that the people who, who aren't devoted, they're the ones with the most opinions. Call him out, bro. Sit up here. Man, man I, wish the sing I wish the singing was better. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish you would sing. I wish you were devoted. How about that? Man, I... I really, I really wish the church was growing. Oh. I really wish you would work. And invite your friends and your neighbors to church. Oh. Man, I hope Nate preaches a lesson that really helps me. I, I hope you're in your Bible every day. <laughs> so that when I preach, because your heart was ready, from the Bible every week. I'm not that. I, know that. I will point you to the Bible, but if you're not in your Bible every day, it's, this scripture's not going to help you. Mm, oh, call it out, bro. Air him out. It's your devotion. If everyone in the church was like me, what kind of church would this be? We have entered, not even the fourth quarter, we've entered overtime. If you like sports, overtime is critical. Yes, sir. That means the game ended in a tie, and now we got to step it up when we're tired, when it's past the end, overtime. It's November. Yes. There's only two months left. We already lost the first week of November. And in overtime, you know what's, what, what's going to uh, show? The devotion. Yes. I want to put it before you. I'll put this goal before myself. Come on, bro. Baptize someone before the end of the year. Come on. Come on There's probably ballpark 60 people in here. What if by December 31st, we were 120? Oh. Oh. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Come on, Nate. It's on you. It's on you. Right. It, I, I, I'm doing my best. I, I've been baptizing people all year. Yeah. Not amen, it's my full time job, but like, it's your purpose. Right. Why is the Bible your purpose? One. One person. It does not take six months to baptize one. No. It does not. Preach. Wow. God's reliable to you. Wow. Come on, Nate. God's relying on you. Come on. God's relying on me. God's relying on us. 
God's reliable kingdom. If everyone in this church was like me, what kind of church would this be? My second point. Giving equals living. Giving equals living. Let's go over here, Acts 4. I really love the book of Acts because it gives us like a little peek, a little window into the first century church. Right? Let's let's read right here. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. Giving equals living. Are we there? I don't hear the pages like rustling, so I think we're there. I'm quick. All right, Acts 4, 32. All of the believers. Notice it's all. If you notice in Acts 2, it was like they devoted themselves, all the believers. So it's not like if you're here and you're like, oh, that's nice. He's preaching to that group over there. He's preaching to the singles. Oh, no, he's just preaching that to campus. No. All the believers, all the believers were one in heart and one in mind. No one claimed any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. It was so powerful there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them. They brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And the money was distributed to anyone who had need. That's benevolent. Joseph, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, who the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, he sold the field he owned. He brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. I really love this passage of scripture. It tells us that there's great preaching, great evangelism. We know in Acts chapter 4, the church had just grown to 5,000. Wow. Right? So, man, it's been growing. All the believers were sharing. God could rely on everyone. Wow. And the church went from 3,000 to 5,000. Wow. There's a saying by a very wise man, the notorious B.I.G. <laughs> more money, more problem. More problem. <laughs> so there's more people, more money, more problems. But when you got more problems, you know what always helps? More money. More money helps. So all the people, they realize the church is growing to 5,000. People have needs. Let me sell what I can sell to take care of everyone in the church. Now, the Bible highlights one guy who does this, and he does this with such a great attitude. It's not the fact that he gave, it was his attitude. Because the leaders, they give him a nickname. They're like, dude, this guy is the son of giving. No. The son of money? He's called the son of what? It was the heart that they recognized behind his giving. He's like, I just want to sell my property and give it. And it's all, I'm, I'm encouraged to give. Like, bro, you're encouraging all of us. Maybe someone shared some good news about Joseph. Maybe someone stood up on Sunday and was like, I just want to lift up my dear brother, Joseph. I mean, I mean, Barnabas, I mean, the son of encouragement. He's such a generous brother. He's awesome. And everyone, everyone clapped. <laughs> and I believe there was a couple, a married couple in the crowd who struggled. Acts chapter 5. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife, Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. So they're like, hey, everyone's excited, everyone's selling stuff, everyone's fundraising money, everyone's giving. Us too. Me too. Bet, bet, bet. Sapphira, come here, bet. <laughs> Let me sell our property. Give it to the church. We want to be, we want to look good too. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself. Maybe they wanted to sell the property for like 10000 and then someone came and said, I'll give you fifteen. <gasps> Whoa, whoa, that's more than I thought. I don't know, it doesn't say what happens in his heart. But greed, rebellion, it crept in there. He wasn't giving to encourage. 
He wasn't giving because it was a conviction. He wasn't giving out of joy. In fact, what he did give, he didn't give the whole thing. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself. But he, he does exactly what Barnabas did, right? He goes and he puts it at the apostles' feet. So in, the apostles are there, the leaders of the church, the church, and they're like, oh, guys, we sold our property. Peter, come here, here's all the money. Then Peter said to Ananias, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and you have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't you? Didn't the land belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? It was your choice. It was your money. What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to human beings, but to God. And when Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. <laughs> Great fear. All who heard what happened. Then some of the campus brothers came forward. They wrapped. This is like in the middle of a church service, guys. They, they wrap his body up and take it out. They buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price that you and Ananias got for the land? What is that right there? Anybody? It's mercy. She had a chance to do what? To be honest. She had a chance. Yes, she said. That is the price, the money they gave. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? I said, the feet of the men who buried your husband, so it took three hours to bury him. They're at the door and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell at his feet and died. The young men came in. They found her dead. Back to work. They carried her out and they buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. My second point, giving is living. You know, sometimes there's this misconception. Like, the God of the Old Testament is like a mean God. He's like, ah. He's just like striking people with plagues and stuff. But like the God of the New Testament, he's like this nice, like loving, like, aw. You don't really have to take what I say serious because I love you. Uh -huh. God is God is God. Yeah. First off, he's very loving and merciful in the Old Testament. He's very loving and merciful in the New Testament. And God also sets forth consequences. When you do something, it produces a consequence. And guys, consequences can be good. Consequence is not a, if we have a negative like feeling with it, but consequences are good. I studied from my test. What's the consequence? You get good grades. So consequences are, are, are good. They can be bad. You don't study for your test. Now yeah, you fail. All right. I think we're a very generous church. I think the majority of us are like Barnabas. And we give, that we encourage, that we work hard and we plan to give to God's church. How do I know? I want to lift up our dear sister, Yuritza. Yuritza, she goes to Safeway. She buys some cookies, some cake pops, some sweet treats. And she goes on campus. In between her classes and the Bible studies and her homework, she got life. And she tells us, she goes, hey guys, I'm raising money for the church. Like, do you want to make a donation, buy this cake pop or this Rice Krispie or whatever? And she's raised hundreds, wow. hundreds of dollars. Because she actually believes that giving, it's a test of her living. Wow. And, I, and I don't mean like, I don't mean like, oh, she's going to like come to church and drop dead. That's not what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Giving, it's a test of your spiritual health. Wow. Are you alive inside spiritually or are you dead? Wow. You can die spiritually. And a big measure of that is giving. It really is. It'll kill you. Get greedy. Get rebellious. 
I, you're going to hate coming to church. You're going to hate praying to God. It's it's going to kill you from the inside. And here's the thing. We think like giving only affects ourselves. This man led his wife and it killed her spiritually. His greed, his rebellion affected his marriage. If he had kids, not, if he had kids, we're not sure, but now his kids don't have parents. Yeah. Giving actually affects everyone around you. Now, why did he die? Because he didn't give? No, he died because he lied. I won't kick anyone out of this church for not giving. I'll kick people out of this church for greed. I'll kick people out of this church for rebellion. Those are the sins God takes seriously, greed and rebellion. But giving, yeah, we all have certain circumstances that come up from time to time. I get it. But the heart has to be to give. Greed and rebellion, there's no room for that in, in God's church. He deals with it. Some of it, well, wow, why did Peter do that? Well, if you're familiar with the scripture in Matthew 16, 13, the one we started with, Jesus gives Peter what? Keys to the kingdom. But then right after that is a verse we don't often talk about. He says, whatever you bind on earth will be, whatever you loose on earth will be. He gives Peter and the leadership the ability to put people out of the church. That's something we have to wrestle with. But God gives his leaders the uh, authority to put people out of the church. Uh, it's not to be done like uh, every day. It's not to like hold this power to give everyone to make everyone scared. We should have a respect yeah. for God's commands. Yeah. I didn't write the Bible, but my job is to uphold it. Yeah. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. Some of some of y'all are getting a, a second chance to give. Right? Some of you are like uh, Sapphira in verse eight, and your leader's asking, "Hey, is that the full price?" How are you going to answer? Come on, bro. Come on, bro. You're going to answer like Sapphira and just sorry, I don't want to live. Or are we going to fix our heart of deceit, greed, and rebellion, the heart, and produce generosity? Yeah. You know, I think about uh, the Aguilars. Oh. Oh. Alex and Miriam have like 10 jobs. Yeah. Right. <laughs> they, they lead a Bible talk. They work very hard for the church. They help Sam and I get tables. Chairs for uh, Olivia had a birthday party yesterday. It was it was a lot. Then my man owns an every table store. Miriam has a job. She works in a dentist office, billing and shipping and receiving and drugging them. So they go. It's true. Anesthesia. No, but she does billing and receiving. And then on top of that, they have a side hustle. They they clean and sell couches. They they probably work 60, 70 hours a week. Total, total work time. On top of their kids' soccer game, he scored his first goal. <laughs> On top of raising a teenager. But why put themselves under that much pressure and that much stress? Why? It's actually not even pressure and stress for them. They're excited to do it because they love God. You know, I think of my dear brother Brady. Brady. <laughs> Uh, we had an opportunity to cook tacos for 60 kids. Thank you, Aaron. And we spent about six, we're up till 1 a.m. Prepping, cutting the meat, seasoning, cutting up fruit, putting in the skewers. On Monday night, this man's had work at 3 a.m. to be up at 3 a.m. to be at work at 4. We're up till 1. And then after we went to work, we did some Bible studies, we cooked some tacos, and we went to midweek. I came to midweek. And to be, it, it's not going to happen all the time. But in the midweek, I smell like tacos. I just spent three hours cooking tacos. But it, we, we each make $300 each wow. cooking tacos. Why? I, I'm giving. I want to live. Me? I want to live. That's what I'm about. Come on, I really want to lift up the silent assassin. Oh. It's a good thing. I don't use assassin. The silent, silent Christian. Ezekiel. Yeah. 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 yeah, he's bro. Like I love Ezekiel. He's so humble. Yeah, like, he's so humble. Just, a man of, you know, they say uh, your yeah, actions speak louder than words. My man just yelled, bro. Yes. Yes. He serves. He serves. This is for the brothers. He pays his rent on time. Come oh, on. And probably about like three weeks ago, he turned in all of his missions goals. He, he actually went above me. Dude, what? What? That's what he's about. Come on, bro. See? 
Ezekiel's a generous guy. Wow. His heart is right with God. Yeah. It's always the heart issue. Yeah. Giving is living. Wow. Uh, can, we, can we pull up the... Why do we give? Where does the money go? Well, number one is between us and God. It's a test of our heart. But number two, we planted so many churches all over the world wow. so that people could be saved. Yeah. This is a 2015, eight years ago, Crown of Thorns project. And just like from Acts chapter 1, what we read, you see the scripture right up there. This was the dream of disciples in 2015. Actually, right here in LA. Yeah. And we wanted to, from Jerusalem, from a church here in LA, eight years ago, plant all of USA and Canada, and then get to the ends of the earth. Because I'm not just here to preach to you like a theory and like fire you up and like, yeah, we inspire you, though I hope that's happening. <laughs> We're actually going to get out of these seats and do it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yep. And we've been doing it for eight years, for much longer than that. I just, this was the earliest crown of thorns I could find. But anything there in green, there's a church in that city. Anything in purple, there's a few disciples, but it's not actually a, a whole church there. And anything in red, well, that's where they were trying to put a church. What does it take to start a church? Money. Yeah, Money. Forty, fifty thousand dollars usually in the United States. And then for churches in third world countries, you'll see over there, like in purple, Chennai. You'll see right there, uh, Manila in purple. Those are third world countries. A, a church of five hundred. Disciples in Manila, and they give 10% a week. It, it, it actually still they can't even rent buildings because they 10% for them is it's like a dollar. I think in Manila, last time I checked, the average income per month was like $200. Like in a whole month, they make a family makes $200. It's 10%, they have to give $2 a month or 20 was it $20 a month? But that's like sacrifice. $20 a month, yeah, it's Manila. Oh, so here we are. Dallas was not planted. Philadelphia's not planted. Houston had a remnant group. Cairo, Hong Kong, nothing there. Nothing there. And disciples raised the money to plant these churches. I love right here, phase two. The Crown of Thorns churches, which is the, the list. Santiago, Moscow, Johannesburg. Those are Crown of Thorns churches. Those are the biggest cities in the world. That's phase one. You have to plant the big city. Phase two, plant the cities around the big city. But <clears throat> there's no list. Because we haven't even done the big cities yet. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Alright, we're going to the next one. We almost got them all! Now we just need Hong Kong. There you go. This is 2017. Wow. And now phase two and the surrounding cities, now we're getting there. There you go. Now Stockholm, Abidjan, Bogota, Kiev's on the map, Kingston, Jamaica, Johannesburg. We planted the largest cities in the world. But if you look under Samaria, what's in green now? Dallas, Fort Worth. Oh. Yeah, Dallas, yeah. Houston. Oh. They became real churches. Hey. Raise your hand if you're baptized in the Dallas church. Yes. What if you're, keep your hand up if you're baptized in the Houston church. Come on, go ahead. Keep your hand up if you're baptized in the LA church. There you go. There you go. None of you guys would be here wow. if it wasn't for the LA church being planted in Portland. All those in the LA church. Thank you for giving, because you helped the Houston and the Dallas people who just raised their hands up here. They wouldn't be here if it wasn't for your sacrifice. Come on. Go to the next one, bro. All right, 2020. I couldn't find 18 and 19, so I found 2020. All of the phase one, phase one is done. But we got to go and get America. If you look under the Samaria right here, you have Ann Arbor, Boise, Minneapolis, Philadelphia, St. Louis. Right? But the list is growing. Now you are in phase two. Look at the phase two churches. There's actually a list. Go to 20, 2021. Mm. Come on. That's a lot of names, huh? Oh, a lot of cities. In fact, you can't even list all the cities. Just, we just put, there's 11 churches in here. There's too much. We're not a room on the paper. Yes. 
I wonder, is it on here? I thought it was on here. Hang on. Looking for Oklahoma. It's going to go to the next one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is what we're doing. Is Oklahoma on there? Yeah. Where's it at? Right after, right after New York? Under Lincoln. Under Lincoln? It's up there. <laughs> That's mine. That's my city. I moved. I took my wife, my pregnant wife. I took 15 people, built the church. They're still baptizing there today. No one can say they, took, they started a church. Me, I can say it. That's right. I, I, I boast. It's, God called me. God can rely on me. Yeah. I know God can rely on you. There we go. And then, you know, the rest of the Turkey, Tunisia. What is this one? Turkmenistan? I don't know what that is, but Stan means it. <laughs> Notice, I just to point out some, some. If you look halfway down the list of the bottom wall, look there. Iran? Wow. Iraq? Libya? Liberia? Israel, had that say, God, we're coming for it all. Wow. You know, I always hear stories in the old movement. I talk with Kip, and he would, he would maybe once every two or three years have to send a new evangelist into the church in Iraq. Wow. Why? He was arrested and killed. <laughs> like, so we, we move church leaders because, oh, we have to plant a new church. It's going to come to a point where all the cities are planted. Wow. Now it's just going deeper into the cities and making more disciples. Yeah. And in some places, people are killed. Yeah. But it's okay. They went to heaven. Yes. And we just get to send someone else. Come on, bro. Why? Wave after wave after wave of disciples. Come on. Jesus said, I'll build my church. The gates of hell aren't going to win. Yeah. This, this is what we're doing. Wow. If, you're, if you're looking at this and you're like, Oh, that's cool. Oh, I've seen this before. Oh, another another mission for more city. You're not with us. You're not with us. This isn't for you. You're in the wrong church. I don't want you here. I don't. I want people, and I believe the Bible calls all God's people to be about this. God didn't die for Long Beach. He died for Long Beach and the world. Yeah. It's, it's always been for all the marbles. Yeah. It's always been that. It's never not been to save the world. And, and we're just trying to do it. Is this a perfect plan? By no means. Is it working? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, bro. Come on. Yeah. Guys, we got to blow out our missions. Yeah. And we got to give. I would encourage you, if you've already given your missions or you're like, I've got a good plan to hit our goal, give 10% more. If you feel like it's on your heart, give 10% more. Come on. Wow. It's not a command. I'm not commanding no one, but it's an offering. If it's on your heart, if it's on your faith, give 10% more than your goal. And if you, if you hit your goal, we love you. If you tried your best and didn't hit your goal, guess what? We love you. It's okay. We're actually, it, it's between you and God to give your heart, to give your best. Come on, come on. That's what he's after. You put a goal of 700, you're like, oh, I only get 400. But I tried. I did this. I, I sold the cupcakes. I, 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 whatever I did, I tried. I love you. Come here. This is, we're not like here to shame anyone. But if you generally see this and you're like, I'm not about this, you're in the wrong place. Let's blow out our missions and have a heart to go above and beyond. Amen? Come on, bro. All right, my last point, and it'll be very, very quick. Acts chapter 8, 1 to 8. There it is. A church that calls us. I well, let's go to Acts 6, then we'll go to Acts 8. All right. Acts chapter 6, verse 1. It says right here, In those days, the number of disciples was increasing. That's, that's the days we got to be in, right? Yes. The Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us. To neglect the ministry of the word of God to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. 
So it's awesome. The church is growing, but there's so many problems because the church is getting bigger that they need more leaders to help the church grow. Right? So if we can ask ourselves, man, like, I think we are growing. But as we're growing, you know what we're going to need? More leaders. So here, the church picks seven men to step up and lead. Let's go over here to uh, verse 5. This proposal pleased the group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith, the Holy Spirit, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. So here we get the list of the first seven leaders, the first seven disciples who went from disciples into what? Leaders in the church. These are the first deacons, right? first leaders. Why? Because the church will always call you and I higher. Now, Acts chapter 7, this guy Stephen preaches the word, and he preaches so good, guess what happens to him? He gets stoned, he gets killed. Now, the second guy on the list, his name is Philip. Let's see what he does. We'll close out here, Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, a church that calls us higher. It says right here, Acts chapter 8. Uh, middle of verse 1 it says on that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria godly men buried Stephen and mourned for him deeply but Saul began to destroy the church going from house to house he dragged off men and women put them in prison those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went Philip, remember he was the second leader on the list, Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and they saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with tricks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed, and there was a great joy in that city. Philip shows up into a city where there's zero disciples. His mission team is how many? Just him. Two if you count God and the Holy Spirit. God and Philip. And he actually converts the city. The church grows. Right? It says there was joy in the whole city. Wow. So this is who we are. You put a disciple in any city, there's going to be a church there. Come back in a few years, there's a church. Right? Awesome. And then the rest of Acts chapter 8, if you look right here in verse 9. Now for some time, a man named Simon practiced sorcery in the city. He amazed all the people of Samaria. The rest of Acts chapter 8, it looks at two leaders. The first guy's name is Simon the sorcerer. He did miracles through magic, through, through actually Satan's power. But he sees God's purpose for his life, that he was actually meant to make disciples instead of do magic. He becomes Wow. Now, very sadly, this, this guy who had the potential to lead, he, his heart never changes. He still wants to do things in the church that are wicked. And so he kind of tanks out. We'll go over here, Acts chapter 8, in verse 26. Wow. All right. uh, Acts 8, 26, it says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So Philip started out on his way. He met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopian. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. The second half of Acts chapter 8 highlights a second leader, right? A second guy who was actually able to lead. Why do we know that? He's very prominent. Who was his boss? The queen of Ethiopia. What was his job? He managed the whole money for the whole country of Ethiopia. That was it. We have a, a place for that in our government. It's called the Secretary of Treasury. They set how we spend the money in America. That, this guy's job, I mean, this guy is a like government official. That's not a political statement. I'm just saying, this guy is influential. He's rich. If you read the rest of the story, he's in a chariot. And he becomes a disciple and gets baptized. Why? Because even though we got to grow numerically, God's church will also produce the best leaders. Yeah. God's church will also produce men and women who grow. Wow. Right? That we'll lead in our communities, lead in our families. At our jobs, we would be the ones getting the promotions. Wow. Why? Because wow. we honor God. In high school, in our sports, we'd be the best. Why? Because we honor God. Yes. The same level of devotion and discipline that we have in our walk with God, we bring to where? Everywhere. Wow. Everywhere we go. 
You know, you get leaders two ways. Number one, you go meet them and baptize them. The other way, I believe, is you have them. What do I mean? Well, Sam and I, we've been blessed with a daughter, but my wife is 11 weeks pregnant. I don't know why you're cheering. God is calling me higher. I have one girl and I have to take care of her, take care of my wife. I don't sleep much. She's just getting out of the diaper phase. And now you know what? We're gonna go right back into the diaper phase. We go right back. You know, like the little little babies, they don't sleep. I go. I'm just getting back in my sleep pattern. Living sleeping through the night. I'm ready. And now I just get to be more tired. God is calling my wife and I higher. God is calling each and every one of you higher. Why? Why the the long list of churches? Why be in a church? That's called higher. Because one day my kids are going to grow up. One day if you have kids, your kids are going to grow up. Some of your kids did grow up in the church. <laughs> there you go. Right? And what kind of church is it going to be like? Is it going to be a church where people like dress up on Sunday and like, but then they're super mean to your kids. They're, there's no purpose. Sin is allowed. Whoa. Or are we going to build a church where our own kids, they want to follow God. They want to be like Jesus. That our own kids would step up and lead. They would finish the job that we're starting of saving the world. Wow. That church, the good one or the bad one, it, it's being built now. It's being built right now. And I hope that that calls you higher. I wake up every day motivated by God and that he died for me. And then my second motivation is my family. Wow. That I want to have somewhere where my, my kids and my wife and I, I can get old and my kids can grow up. And that they would be called to follow God. It's a very motivating thing. Wow. And in the same way, and it's hard if you don't have kids, in the same way, you got to ask yourself, where is God calling me higher? Yeah. You're going to become a leader or you might have to have a leader if you're married. If you're dating, get married. All right? My brothers and sisters, I love you. Let's wrap up right there. That is Restoring a Radical Church. Thank you very much. Come on. Come on.